All right, welcome to episode 30. It was a nice round number. 30 of the Cigar Snob Podcast. About 30, man. I'm Nick Jimenez. I'm here with Eric Calvino. What's up, what's up? And Ivan Ocampo. Bon dia. All right, so in this episode of the podcast, we will be smoking something from AJ Fernandez, talking about Eric's recent trip to Central America, recapping some of the uh, pro sports news of the day and all sorts of other stuff. But first, a word from our sponsor, Villiger Cigars. Villiger Cigars, celebrating 130 years in tobacco, unveils its first ever full-bodied premium handmade cigar in the Villiger La Vencedora. The Villiger La Vencedora is the follow-up cigar to the highly acclaimed Villiger La Flor de Inclán and Villiger Sandoro Colorado. This Nicaraguan puro, wrapped in a beautiful Nicaraguan Habano Curo wrapper, boasts a potent full-bodied smoking experience featuring highly seasoned, hearty flavors. The Villiger La Vencedora, which translates to the victor, emits a billowing aromatic smoke throughout the smoky experience. The Villiger La Vencedora, a palate-pleasing, full-bodied, yet elegant cigar that will satisfy the cigar connoisseur as well as the casual smoker. All right, on this episode, our featured cigar, we have one every time. This time around, it is Bellas Artes by A.J. Fernandez. I will uh, read briefly their description from the A.J. Fernandez website. Quote, Decadent and superb in flavor and aroma, Bellas Artes stands as a true testament to the fine art of cigar making. A proprietary A.J. Fernandez hybrid wrapper plays the perfect complement to the special binder from Kilali and premium fillers from Nicaragua, Honduras, and Brazil. Each age, premium cut of tobacco combines... I like that, cut of tobacco. Uh, combines the uh, to provide the most extravagant and sumptuous smoking experience. The Spanish box press beauty will spoil your palate with notes of cream, white pepper, cinnamon, and orange peel. We're smoking this in Toro, which is a 6x54. Whoa, 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 whoa. Speak for yourself. Whoa, are we smoking, smoking different smoking sizes? smoking it in Toro. I'm smoking it in Short Churchill. Oh, man. Ivan, what's Ivan got? Toro? Toro. All right. Toro, Toro, Toro. So uh, this has a Nicaraguan wrapper and binder, as well as fillers from Nicaragua, Honduras, and Brazil. As we mentioned, this is AJ's uh, hybrid Rojita wrapper uh, and a binder. It's a um, good Havana 92, I assume. That's Habano uh, from Kilali. So uh, this is the first reference to Kilali that I at least have seen explicitly in a in marketing for a cigar. Oh uh, uh, yeah, no doubt. I have not seen that either. Yeah. So uh, so anyway, but I mean, it is in Nicaragua. It's a but I guess he's right. just being a little bit more specific in terms of where in Nicaragua he's growing it. But I've personally not been to his Kilali farm. Right, right, right. So anyway, uh, so far. How are, are we all roughly the same amount into the no, cigar? I think you guys, well, you specifically. I started a little earlier. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but no, I'm, mine, I'm, I literally just lit it, but it's nice. This, this is a cigar that uh, has grown on me. At first, I wasn't nuts about it. And I don't know if it's a couple years in the humidor or, or just the, the flavor. Pro- I've come around on that profile, but it's nice. It's got a nice cedary, creamy situation balanced with that. You know, it's it, it's quite a bit of pepper and spice, right? Which I think, yeah, uh, is really noticeable up front. But that creamy cedar, mm-hmm. uh, I think, in the background uh, makes it all balanced. So I I dig that. Before yep. I heard uh, Nick's description, uh, I was thinking red pepper, cinnamon, and he said it, they describe it as white pepper. Uh, but yeah, it, 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 that's not my favorite flavor profile. I think of like a red hot. <laughs> when I'm yeah, smoking yeah, you, this. You always uh, comment like when there's too much pepper, right? You always immediately that's not your favorite thing. I but, wonder if, if the the red hue of the wrapper, which he mentions, has anything to do with that, but but it's still a good cigar. It's got a uh, a lot of different flavors, like you know, I get maybe some like butterscotch. Uh well, so, I yeah, I like cream. the balance that yeah. it has. I mean even even though for you you're not crazy about the pepper, it's not just like pepper and nothing else. Right, it it does have some creaminess to it, like you said, some cinnamon, some cedar, so it's balanced in, in yeah. that sense in, yeah. in terms of of pepper versus uh, like savory versus sweet, creamy versus sharp. 
it's balanced in that sense. So I like that. I think the reference to the orange peel thing here is interesting too. I don't know if I would call it orange peel if I hadn't read this, but there is sort of like an acidity uh, yep. to the to the cigar too. Um, so yeah, it's 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 balanced. Um, the the ash so far on mine is is be- I, I'm always a little iffy on like how significant that is. It to, is significant in terms the, of like yeah. construction. Yeah, it exactly. Is, man. Uh, but it's like a nice bright white. It's uh, it's tight. There's none of those like you know cracks. I don't feel like this is gonna fall apart on me anytime soon. Uh, which I, I think I wish we had like a counter going of how many times I ended up wearing the ash from the cigars that they were smoking. I'm not particularly good at not getting ash all over myself. So we'll see how far I can take this. Well, it's tough, right? When you're talking this much and right, uh, gesturing wildly, which gesturing you can't see. wildly as you do. Yeah. But no, th- this uh, but anyway, just back to wrap up the cigar uh for this section. Extremely enjoyable. Uh, if you're into the balance of, of a well-made cigar, and the construction is spectacular. The wrapper is gorgeous, so... It's got a little bit of strength to it, too. Heck, yeah. Yeah. Not your novice cigar. Say medium plus, maybe medium full as, yeah. as, as it goes. So... All right, and now our podcast will travel 881 kilometers from Kilali... <laughs> oh, <laughs> look at that. I like it. Yeah, yeah. That. Did a little fancy editing here in the podcast so people wouldn't hear me Googling this. 881 kilometers, a 15 hour drive from Quilali, Nicaragua, all the way across Tegucigalpa, going into Guatemala to Las Flores. And where, almost Mexico, by the way. And it's almost north, Mexico, north yeah. Guatemala. Uh, where Eric was uh, on a recent trip in Guatemala, landed in Las Flores, but after landing there, what'd you do? Where'd you do? What did you do? And where did so, you go? Uh, so we stayed at the Las Lagunas Boutique Hotel and Resort. And I think Museum is also in the name. Uh, but beautiful uh, boutique hotel. Really boutique. I mean, there's 19 bungalows. And uh, all of them over water on this uh, beautiful lagoon. Yeah, just spectacular, man. Uh, everything about it was great. We visited a couple different Mayan ruins. Had a... Uh, had a Mayan shaman uh, do a, a sacred fire ceremony, Ooh. which was really freaking cool. Wow. Uh, and it involved cigars, which was awesome. It, oh, not cigars, but tobacco. Uh, so part of the ritual involved uh, smoking this very rustic, unpressed. Uh, I can't call it a cigar because it's not a cigar. Uh, but, but this uh, cigar-like cylinder. And uh, and then based on how it burned, it said certain things about your energy and all this kind of stuff. Really fun stuff. Uh, if if anyone has a chance, one uh, if you're interested in a boutique hotel experience in the middle of the jungle, uh, la- it's hard to beat Las Lagunas. The food was excellent. The rooms were amazing. Uh, the spa was awesome. Uh, and then the tours you can take around there if you're into uh, like ancient civilizations and things like that. That that trip to the Tikal ruins was unreal, right? Like life-changing type stuff. Uh, you climb to the top of this uh, temple, this Mayan temple that's like, I don't know, some two, 3,000 years old. And, uh, and then you watch the sunset from there, which is uh, pretty awesome. I wanted to smoke a cigar up there, but you know why I couldn't? Why? I was so fucking out of breath from climbing oh, the wow. stairs. It was uh, it was so damn it was it was brutal. The climb was was tremendous, and we got there right before sunset. And I wanted to fire up a cigar, and I didn't have the energy to even pull it out of my bag. Oh man! So, I, but I'm, I did smoke the cigar afterwards at the uh, at the resort. So I'm this looking entire, at, this entire time you're you're describing that. I'm thinking of some virgin being sacrificed on the top of this. Uh, I know that's what you think of with boy. Mayan civilization and, c- and cigars. Thing. Yes, yes. But no, no virgins were sacrificed on this trip. <laughs> qua, qua, qua. Um, I'm, I'm looking at pictures on uh, in the you know, Google advisor. map result for La Laguna's Boutique Hotel, and it's pretty impressive looking. Pretty badass is what yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So the, uh, the owner of the, of the resort uh, owns Gallo Beer, which is uh, Guatemala's like, national beer. And... Uh, Man, it, that so the the resort sits where like the guy's old like vacation home was, and it is just outrageous. The rooms are awesome. Well, food and the drink f- options. Food was tremendous. Yeah. What does one eat in Guatemala? Well, between, so well you can. So the nice thing ceremony. is the resort has uh, has 
traditional Guatemalan dishes that they can make for you. But the chef, Michael Mueller, is, uh, is all European influence. So you can have these Guatemalan dishes or you, you can have very French dishes. Uh, one night I had, uh, I had roast duck. Uh, another night I had a, a, a um, ribeye. <laughs> you, could, you could go any direction. There was great pastas. There was all sorts of, uh, of food options, and all of it was very good. Uh, I even tried the, uh, the traditional Guatemalan dishes as well. Uh, Nick, you've been to Guatemala, right? It's been a long time. Uh, but yes, I have been to Guatemala. I, I didn't do anything like that, though. I was just in Guatemala City and uh, Antigua. Yeah, Antigua is is cool and ancient and all that for but it's a, it's a very different thing than going to uh say Tikal. Yeah. or Yasha, the other one that I went to. Uh, so anyway, really uh I can't recommend it enough. I mean, it was just an awesome trip. Uh and it was exactly what the doctor ordered after a very stressful issue. Uh so that that worked very well for me. The, there was the howler monkeys. You ever been around a howler monkey? Not a howler monkey, no. Holy shit, those things sound like, like a tiger is coming at you, and it's just a damn little monkey. Can you give us an example of I what a howler your best, You're not going to do your best howler monkey? I'm not going to do a howler monkey sound, no. <laughs> no. But I have, I have something better. So that was that was not from Google. That was not from anything. That's that's me stopping as these monkeys are screaming above me on the tr- in the trees. I think maybe you didn't go to Guatemala. And you just went to see Jurassic Park. That's exactly what I said. It sounded <laughs> like I was like, like it sounds like a T Rex is coming through here. Yeah. So that's literally from my phone, just standing there recording it. It was uh, it was impressive. So those guys wake you up in the morning. That type of howling, which doesn't sound like howling as much as it sounds very, like sounds, growling. Sounds very soothing. It's super, super soothing. Would you, how, how long Very does it take relaxed. you to fall asleep among the howler monkeys? <laughs> it was really more of a wake-up. Yeah. So it, was a, it was an abrupt wake-up. <laughs> Got it. So um, we are very close to uh, LeBron James getting rid of the entire squad and just replacing them with howler monkeys for next season because the Cavaliers, by the way, this is our segue into the NBA. Oh, that was yeah. your Oh, yeah. okay. Smooth. Yeah. Super smooth. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the Cavaliers are one game from hiring a shaman. Uh, they are down two to three to the Boston Celtics, and on the other side of the league, the Rockets and the Golden State Warriors are tied at two. So a piece. Right now, how do you guys see those two series going? <clears throat> LeBron's gonna extend this to seven at least. Yeah, I, I think so too. But I, but the interesting thing is, uh, everyone's holding. Serve right, so, and Boston has the uh, home home field home court advantage. So, it'll be interesting. That game seven is gonna be is gonna be fun to watch. Yeah, it's uh, LeBron against the fighting Brad Stevens because yep. they don't have many stars. The fighting either. Brad Stevens is <laughs> they got a bunch of stars though. They're young. No, no, they got a bunch young. of studs. Yes, yeah. but not stars. They don't have stars. Yeah. They don't have any stars. I think Horford's very underrated. Okay, but listen, he's not. You're saying star fame wise. Yeah, he's like, not a Harden or a Curry or a LeBron. No, none of that. N- not a mega star, but he's definitely a star. He's a he's a great player. Yeah. but he's not a star. We may be star. drawing these lines in different places. Yeah, yeah. But like, if you're, but anyway. you're building a team around somebody, I don't know that you go Horford. That maybe you should, but it probably wouldn't have been your first thought before this play. No, of course not. But um, they're kicking ass. Yeah. Uh, and on the other side, where that series is tied, I, I still think uh, Golden State yep. takes it in the end. Unle- did they have any injuries or anything going on? Not that I'm aware of. Do okay. they? Well, this is a great update. Yeah, <laughs> you're welcome, listeners. Cancel your NBA TV subscriptions. All you need is the Cigar Snob Podcast. Uh, with that, that's not true. You don't only need the Cigar Snob Podcast. You also need El Galang Cigars. El Galán Reserva Especial comes in four sizes, all of them box-pressed. The 5 by 52 Airosos, the 5 and 3 quarters by 54 Apuestos, the 6 by 52 Gallardos, which is a torpedo, and the 6 by 60 Obesos. All of these are 100% Nicaraguan tobacco. 
featuring Jalapa Oscuro wrappers. They are available in stores nationwide. You can find El Galang Cigars online <clears throat> Excuse me, at elgalangcigars.com. That's E-L-G-A-L-A-N cigars.com. Also find them on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search for El Galang Cigars. That's El Galang Cigars, El Galang Cigars, El Galang Cigars. Anything else we want to say about El Galang Cigars? El Galang Cigars. There you go. All right. So... Uh, with that, we're shifting to the news in cigars. We got a few news items here to uh, up- update you all with. In no particular order, humidor maker Daniel Marshall has announced a program called DM Cash for Clunkers. So that's what it sounds like if you're familiar with that. How long ago was Cash for Clunkers? What was that, like five years ago-ish? But you remember Cash yeah. for Clunkers. Yeah, the cars. Yeah, right. but I you mean... You turn in uh, your clunker and you get back some cash, except in this case, uh, you're getting DM cash, which means you can put it toward a Daniel Marshall humidor. Uh, since the program's launched last month, according to Daniel Marshall, and actually he posted videos of a whole bunch of humidors, so uh, there's proof, 135 customers have cashed in their quote-unquote clunker humidors for a DM humidor. Uh, customers can trade in any humidor and receive $100 vouchers and complimentary UPS shipping of one of three Daniel Marshall. So I'm a little confused. Uh, we'll maybe update this later. It says you get a $100 voucher, but you can redeem it for one of three Daniel Marshall humidors. So I'm a little unclear as to whether with that 100 bucks you get one humidor. From Daniel Marshall. In any case, or you get one hundred dollars towards towards humidor, right? yeah, but it cool. it sounds like it covers one of the humidors. Like if like you could use the hundred bucks to pay for one humidor. You couldn't figure out this question before getting to the no, new segment. No, no. Uh, in any case, uh, if you want to figure it out for yourself, head to Daniel Marshall. That's Marshall with two L's. DanielMarshall.com, and go to the humidor tab on the website. And you'll, uh, you'll find more information there as well as uh, Daniel's video of a bunch of humidors that have been turned in so far. The uh, FDA comment period. So the FDA is soliciting comments from the public about their uh, regulation of premium cigars is open. Head over to uh, cigarsnobmag.com slash podcast. If you click on the link for this episode, which is episode 30, you'll find a link to uh, where you can leave comments for the FDA telling them to keep their hands off of your cigars or whatever you want to tell them. You can tell them anything you want, but that's my suggestion. Blend Bar with Davidoff Cigars, which has locations in Indianapolis, Nashville, Pittsburgh, and Woodlands, Texas, which is just outside of Houston, has announced that it is now in a partnership serving only, and this is just in the vodka category, all the vodka they serve is Fuzzy's Vodka. So I just thought this was kind of interesting. Normally we wouldn't get this granular on like these little deals, but I thought it was interesting that Davidoff uh, or a Davidoff branded uh, or Davidoff partner lounges were switching to an American made vodka that's made with corn and not potato. Um, Well, so here's the only bit of insight I have on that. Okay. Is Blend Bar is in Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. Fuzzy's Vodka is all over Indianapolis. Got it. And they've even uh, they've even got an indie car running in this weekend's and and last year as well. Oh, okay. And I'm sure it wasn't the first time. Uh, so they're 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 big in Indianapolis big and in Indy. Uh, so uh, which I will be there tonight. Tonight for Sunday's race. Boom! Awesome. The Indy 500. All right. So mark your calendars for next week when we'll do NBA, NHL, and Indy 500 updates. Oh yeah. Amazingly, our Indy 500 update will probably be more detailed and useful than the other <laughs> yes. two. <laughs> so, so there's that. Uh, Villiger has been importing Brazilian tobacco since 1888. In seven, I'm sorry, in 1979, they announced uh, they opened a Brazilian Villiger subsidiary as well as a factory. Well, now that factory is being replaced by a newer, larger one in Feira de Santana. I don't know if I said that right. The second largest city in the state of Bahia. So this is a bigger, badder factory for Villiger. Hopefully uh, we will see that translate into, you know, uh, 
more widely available Villiger products, which have performed well on our top 25 list and in the rating section of Cigar Snob Magazine. And um, hopefully a trip down there to visit them. And hopefully a yeah, trip down not? to visit them. So uh, that's where they make... Uh, if you're listening, Rene. <clears throat> right. So that factory produces uh, only Brazilian puros. So they have facilities elsewhere in the world, but this factory makes Villiger Sandoro Maduro and uh, brands that are distributed exclusively in Europe like Villiger Celebration and Corrida. So especially if you're a fan of Villiger Sandoro Maduro, uh, this factory... Wait, what about Tobajara? Don't they make that there too? Uh, Is that a product they don't distribute uh, anymore? I think they might not be making that anymore. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, but the original factory was called Tobajara. Mm. And so, so yeah, but I, I think now... Um, the... Yeah, I, I don't... We'll cut all of this out. I don't think the new factory is called Tobajara either. I think they like renamed it completely and all that. So anyway, that's the news from Cigarville. Bon dia y camisinha. Nice. Whoa. That Caipirinha. means... That means... Caipirinha. That means, <laughs> that means, <laughs> samba. That means good morning and condom. Good morning and condom. In that order. All right. Good morning, condom. Good morning, condom. <laughs> Does, if it replies to you, is, is the yeah. way. that's when we need to have a talk. Good morning, Billy boy. Uh... All right, so we are done with the news from Cigar Town, and now we are going to round out uh, quite nicely, I think, the uh, our little panels that we've been doing lately. In the last two episodes, you heard us talk about fast food restaurants that give you caca. Then what we uh, have in our, our picadera or hors d'oeuvre spreads uh, at home, now... We're going to make some recommendations on something you can pair with your little spread. What are your favorite cheap wines to stock at home? Maybe when you have company over or something like that. So, uh, you know, I I have large groups of people at home uh, with my kids' birthdays and all these kinds of things. Oh, you always give me that stuff. Yep. I know. I know. And, I, and uh, I knew when it. you've got a large group of Cubans, you give them... Torre Pingong wine. Torre uh, Pingong, party. That's the that's the recommended cheap wine. I don't know who can you know. I don't, I don't know if how far out of Florida it's distributed, but um, does very well in the Calvino household. So I give my friends good wine, but for my in laws, <laughs> 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 for my in laws, I like give them uh, Alamos Malbec. Mm. I think it comes in at about eight bucks. I think you gifted me a bottle of that once. No. Yes, you did. No, I saved that stuff for for my in-laws. Mm. No. Mm-mm. But anyways, it's good for eight bucks. Awesome. And I and actually had a five dollar wine from Target that was pretty good this weekend too. But I would definitely recommend the Alamos. What Why about you, you Nikki? Uh, this is a wine that I was introduced to actually by my grandmother. Uh, and it is the... That's J- where all good recommendations right. come from. The uh, Jadot Beaujolais Village. Uh, I've had ooh. Beaujolais before. <laughs> yeah, a little Beaujolais. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, this is a um, a wine that you can get from, at least from Total Wine, for $9.97. Um, I'll yeah, re- that one's uh, available everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'll read the uh, the brief description Total put up here. Uh, this crisp, fruit-forward, juicy wine has expressive aromas and flavors of red, uh, ripe red berries with nice weight in the mouth, pairing <laughs> with grilled <laughs> white meat. you got to love a Beaujolais with a, a nice weight Beaujolais in the mouth. Beaujolais with weight in the mouth. Um, and actually, uh, this, I don't know how many of our listeners are bakers, but uh, Elsie has used this wine in, um, I don't know if you guys remember, I brought in that red wine chocolate cake once. Yep. That's what was in there. Uh, so it's also good for, uh, for, you know, it's cheap enough that you can, like, drink it while you cook with it, which is nice, too, uh, if you like cooking with red wine. So. Pass the bougie upon the left-hand side. <laughs> so. I, th- I think the title we gave this was bad. I don't think we should have called it the best cheap wine for us. Sure. I think it's stuff that we could have probably picked up at a grocery store or at your local yeah, grocery store wine. Yeah. Grocery store wine, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, those are our recommendations. To recap, if you are out looking for wine and you're not quite sure... What you should be looking for, our recommendations are Torre Pingong, Alamos Malbec, and Jadot Beaujolais Village. By the way, did we actually cover what Torre Pingong means? Uh, no, we didn't. Uh, it, it translates roughly to like phallic tower. 
Well, not, I mean, not in mm. Spain. That would be in Cuban, yes. Sure. But in Spain, it doesn't. In Spain, uh, Pingat is raining. Well, on the top Pingando, it's raining. Sure, but there's so a it's reason. It's a rainy it's, tower. But there's a reason that wine does especially well here. Oh, it kills it here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nothing like showing up to someone's house for a party with a bottle of Torre Pingón. That's it's, right. Pretty special look on the guy's face when you give him that. Right. My, my mom, actually, up. my mom for a while now has been collecting uh, obscenely named foods and beverages. So Torre Bingong. Yeah, yeah that's got to be in the, yeah, in pe- the Hall of Fame. People who know she she has this collection, she's got a good number of bottles of this from people who keep bringing oh. it to her. But, but she's got also, she has like bitch wine. Oh, okay, no, can uh, we save this for the next episode and you just oh, bring sure. in, like, we'll just do a little, bring show, and tell, yeah, do yeah, little yeah. show and tell sure. of all the stuff? Sure. That's got to be good. We can do that. Back to the featured cigar. Again, we are smoking Bellas Artes by A.J. Fernandez. Uh, two of us are smoking the Toro, and one of us is smoking, what are you smoking again? Short Churchill. Short Churchill. Uh, again, all of these are uh, Nicaraguan wrappers with Kilali. I just like saying Kilali. I see that. Yeah, binders. Uh, how are you guys doing on it? You know what? The... Um even the the pepper and spice have subsided now. Everything is subsided to the Very point nice. that it's super smooth. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm really enjoying it now. Yeah, for sure. Um, I've I think I've been moving through it a little more slowly, uh, just given my my hosting duties here. Uh, but yeah, it's it's performed nicely. It just just went out because I was uh, going on and on about nonsense. Um, and the retail price is pretty good on this too, right? What is it? So it looks like. Uh, a six and a half by fifty eight gordo is about ten bucks a stick, and uh, and that goes down all the way to the the robusto at a couple dollars less than that. So yeah, that's good value. Yeah, heck yeah, definitely right? Eight bucks, eight bucks for a uh, for a robusto and and ten for a gordo. Absolutely. So yeah. All right. So yeah, I mean we're all we're all into this, and I think the thing with with AJ especially is, and this is not too long ago we we ran a story about AJ. Um, in in the magazine, and a lot of it centered on my having gone to meet up with him in Kentucky for an event, uh, where tons of people came out, and uh, it was funny that more so than other feedback that you hear from consumers when they're talking about their favorite brands, AJ fans are nuts about uh, just the consistency, which you know, walking through a factory with him, you see how like how maniacal he is about all those little details that are. Such a big part of making consistent cigars. Every time that we've smoked this, I think we've had, you know, good experiences with the construction and 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 all that. It, it delivers what what they say they're going to deliver. It sounds like a you know like a given, but it's no, it's definitely not a given. I mean, especially in cigar making, right? right? Yeah, you that's know. what I mean. So uh, yeah, the the other interesting thing about this particular cigar is that it is quite different from the majority of AJ's portfolio. Right. Right. So it's it's more. Uh, more wood, more cinnamon, more cedar uh, than than the majority of his portfolio, which tends to be more towards pepper, more mm-hmm. earth, more chocolate, and so so this is a nice change of pace if you want to stay within the AJ fold but have a different experience. Uh, I really dig this smoke. Yeah, for sure. So um, AJ Fernandez, the Golden Knight of the cigar industry. By the way, <laughs> the Las Vegas Golden Knights. Well, are I going mean, to the, the... He's the Black Knight, though. He's always dressed in black. He is the, the Black, black Knight. Knight. And why do we have to segue like this? It's just a funny... Why do we have to do this, Nick? We don't have to do it. Okay. You, you had a better segue? No, I don't. I think it was like the lack oh. of segue would have been the better segue. Well, you know, I think this, all of this that we just did was... Matt, is a good this segue. is a great sure. segue. This is good radio. Vegas Golden Knight tickets. According to the Las Vegas Review Journal, the average ticket price is $1,167, and they are fetching as high as $10,000 on StubHub. This is for tickets to see the Las Vegas Golden Knights in Las Vegas. For in the, the NHL uh, Finals. In the NHL, right, because in the they just, Cup Finals. Uh, so they, they just got in, and this is a brand new franchise, right? Who would have thunk they had so many hockey fans out in Las Vegas? Well, so the reason that we're even talking about this is because your Oakland Raiders yep. will be moving to Las Vegas. So the fact that this brand new NHL franchise, or I don't know if they moved the franchise from somewhere else, but whatever. So this brand new hockey team uh, in an area that's not known for hockey fans, as you just pointed out, is selling so well 
that's got to bode well for the Raiders, right? I think they'll do well. Um, I don't know if the hockey team came from another place. Yeah. But you expect when Las Vegas starts a pro pro sports franchise, you're going to get a bunch of homegrown fans for the first time, right? Mm -hmm. And then you're also going to get fans that are going to travel. For example, Oakland Raider fans will drive over the two hours or the three hours to go there. And they have fans all over the country that will just go to Vegas like make myself a yeah, yeah, and make, make a, weekend. a weekend out of it. Yeah. I mean, um, even me, I've, I I can't, haven't been to a hockey game since I was a kid and I couldn't care less about it. But I would work a Golden Knights game into a trip to Vegas for sure. Well, and, and so if you're willing to do that, that means you'd be willing to do it for just about any franchise in Vegas. That's what I'm saying, but I, I probably wouldn't. Any sports, I should say. Yeah, any sports but, franchise. Exactly. But it's, it's just, a, you know, especially in Vegas where, you know, I, I think there's sort of a limited breadth of things. Like this really expands the type of activity that you can look forward to if you're going to Vegas. I and what, begged I, you as a Siegfried and Roy guy. Oh, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. I have. I, I make sure to clear a lot of room in my home office for all the flamboyant gesturing. Oh, yeah. Oh, PD, yeah. PD jumps up on things and <laughs> you, howls. You, you spray paint PD like a, like <laughs> like a, a tiger. tiger. <laughs> <laughs> Insert PD howl here. That's right. Yeah, we'll get the PD howl in here. Uh, so yeah, um, so you would go, Ivan, you would go to Vegas to see. Oh, absolutely. I love Vegas as is now my favorite team will be playing there. I'd love to. So you're probably the biggest Vegas fan of the three of us, right? Sure. So you're going to Vegas. Would you go see the Golden Knights? Like forget the playoffs. If they were just regular season, just to get more of a, you know, non fan perspective, right? Because you're, would you, you're in Vegas. Would you work in, "Eh, I'm going to go see a hockey game. Sure. If I was there. I yeah. mean, of course, I'm not, if right, I'm not right. a fan, I'm not going to go there just to see the game. But if I'm there, I definitely, exactly. especially if it was worth, you know, something important, you know, right, I'd, right, right. I'd definitely go see it. The NFL, speaking of, has imposed a kneeling ban. So there was uh, all of the controversy surrounding the kneeling during the anthem protests that uh, generated all that, all that hullabaloo last season. So the new policy requires on-field players and personnel to stand for the anthem. So the idea is that you're either standing on the field or you're waiting in the locker room until afterward. Otherwise, you uh, get hit with a fine. Any uh, any thoughts on this? Uh, what, so let, my- let's start with what were your thoughts before, like before this decision? What, where was your head on all of this? It just seems like bad leadership, always from Goodell. Yeah, uh, that's exactly where I was going. It just seems like every time, well, it's not a knee-jerk re- reaction because most of the ownership is probably putting pressure on the league to, to do something about it, but it just seems so clunky. Every time they do something, it doesn't seem like they do it right. I think if they would have just let it stay as is, as how it was this past year, I think the story just goes away. Mm-hmm. It stops being a national story. And yet now by doing this ban... Now, now th- there's more reason to be pissed off. Not you're banning me? Right. Right now, I'm not... NFL football players are employees of the NFL. And when you're on the clock at work, you have to follow the rules of your job. So that's how I felt about it in the beginning, right? They have to just follow the rules of their job, and it is what it is. But now they've made it so ridiculous, and everything that they've done, as you said, is so clunky. Then now it's like okay now you're just you're just a bunch of idiots. It seems just like they leave just, it alone already. Seems like they just want to take attention uh, take attention away from you know all the cameras focusing on all the guys kneeling and sitting down on the sidelines, which it just seems like now the media is gonna like swarm in and try to take even more attention into the into the yeah. tunnels and they're yeah, gonna so try to get like in who's there. Not. So who's out? Right. Yeah, so yeah it's gonna be who's like hiding it's, yeah, it's in the like shadows? Count at the beginning right. of I know. Every game. It's, it's, just let it go and let the. I mean, now at this point, just. Just let it go. It's just it's it has nothing to do with the actual sport. I understand why the guys are protesting, right? Like even in the middle of this, like as this news comes out, news comes out about uh, a basketball player who got tased. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't tase me, bro. Don't tase me, bro. So I, you know, I'm I, I've, I mean, I get it. I I totally get why the guys are doing it. But like Ivan said, I just feel like the NFL leadership on it is always off base. You know, th- this has become a national story. Okay, let let the guys protest. Just let it go, and the story goes away. Right. It also, I mean, you know, I, I don't know that I, 
I guess I, my. And by the way, I, I don't like the protest to to be held during the national anthem. That that a lo- that part bothers me. Right. Because the national anthem has nothing to do with what you're protesting about. Right. Uh, as Americans, I think everyone should uh, salute the flag and. Yeah, the timing lent itself to misunderstanding. And- yeah. So that part, I don't like that about it. But I also don't like how the NFL is handling it. Right. And so. to to your point, I think the way the NFL is handling it also ends up hurting the the players who are engaged in that protest, not just in the sense that they can no longer protest that way, but you know, a lot of this came out because you know, the the first kneeler, Colin Kaepernick, not necessarily the most sophisticated political social strategist, which is fine. You don't expect him to be. He's a football player. So over the course of that year, it seemed like, you know, new people had kind of come into the fold and that whole movement, like it or not, had begun to sort of mature and refine its message. And now it all becomes about this stupid ban thing. And you, it, it sort of keeps the conversation from getting to a productive place. Yep. Because now we're just talking about Roger Goodell. Yep. And whether he's a stooge of the owners. And not and, about the issue. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. I know. Anyway. So uh so there's that. There's your your kneeling update. We're doing However, very... I did walk into a store last yeah. year, uh slightly you know, related to this. Sure. So last year during football season on like a like a Monday night or a Thursday night, someone had an event. And I and a cigar event. And so I walked into the store. And they were watching something like uh, American Idol or, or Dancing with the Stars or something like that. So this is a, this is a cigar store full of dudes, watching, uh, like again, like it was like Dancing with the Stars. Weird, totally weird, <laughs> and or, or Amer- one of those kinds of shows. Yeah. And and so I asked the store and I was like, hey, and I, it may have even been the Dolphins playing, uh, and we were in Miami. So, I asked the. The store owner, hey, you know, uh, you guys are not having the Dolphin game on? And he goes, if they're going to allow those people to kneel, then I'm not having the games on my TV. And I thought, boy, that's ridiculous. This whole thing has gotten out of control. Yeah. And so to bring that back again uh, seems ridiculous. Well, what are you going to do? So, uh, all right. You know who we're not kneeling for? We stand up for Villager Cigars, our show sponsor, Here's a word from our sponsor before we move on. La to Vencedora. La Vencedora. Villager La Vencedora. Uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah, here's a word from Villager Cigars, our, our episode sponsor. Villager Cigars is celebrating 130 years in tobacco and unveiling its first ever full-bodied premium handmade cigar in the Villager La Vencedora. It's a follow-up to the highly acclaimed Villager La Flor de Inclán and Villager Sandoro Colorado. The Nicaraguan Puro is wrapped in a beautiful Nicaraguan Habano Oscuro wrapper and boasts a potent full-bodied smoking experience featuring highly seasoned, hearty flavors. The Villager La Vencedora is a palate-pleasing, full-bodied yet elegant cigar that will satisfy the cigar connoisseur as well as the casual smoker. Make sure that you visit Villager online at villagercigars.com. Check them out on Facebook, facebook.com slash villager.northamerica. Twitter at Villager Cigars, that's cigars with an S at the end, and Instagram at Villager Cigar. Just Villager Cigar, no S at the end, on Instagram. Okay, and as always, we are rounding out this episode of the Cigar Snob Podcast with our parting recommendations. This is where we let you know some things that we've come across or done recently that you should eat, smoke, drink, watch, do, uh, see. What do you got for the people, Ivan? So last show, I recommended an app, and I think I'm going to follow it up with another one this time. I'm trying to load it up as we speak here. This app called Relax Melodies. Okay, so ooh, ooh, I feel yeah. relaxed. <laughs> I feel so, relaxed already. If you have trouble sleeping, like myself, try to get this app. I've used it for the last three days, and it feels like somebody gave slipped me on like a date rape drug. <laughs> By the way, I've woken up. Because I wake up groggy as hell. You got me too by your phone app? (laughs) Tremendous. I'm going to try to play a couple couple little songs for you here. So you create your own melodies here, combining different sounds of like fire, rain. Like a sacred fire? Like a Mayan sacred fire? Yeah, you compose these things. So So what's what's this mix here? What do you you, you call it? 
Yeah. What do you so do? you call you, yeah, what you, do you, what do you, you name your own thing. So this is I got a little bit of this is like ocean breeze with like an Asian horn here. I call it the salty chino. <laughs> So give this a listen right here. Oh, that's good. That's good, right? A salty massage. <laughs> oh, you sleep like a baby. Oh, Are there any howler monkeys in there? Oh, howler. <laughs> ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> Anyways, check it out. Nice. Wow. So that's Relax Melodies, right? That's what it's called? Yep. Cool. And how does how does Eva feel about this? She passes out before I even turn it on. No shit. Yeah, she doesn't. She doesn't. Ha- she has no idea if it's on. Oh, Barbie would like reach over, grab the phone, and like throw it somewhere. <laughs> she would not have any part of that. She likes silence. So uh, it's my turn, right? Yeah. Oh, so I, well. Listen, I already talked about it. Uh, I will be heading out to Indianapolis for the race this weekend. So start your engines. Indy five hundred, man. That's a good time. If uh. If you're going to watch it on TV, God bless you. But if you ever get a chance, make it out to to the Speedway. That's a damn good time, man. So, Indy 500, that's what I got. Cool. Ryan Hunter Ray. Shout out to Bob and Indy. Bob and Indy? Bob and Indy? No, what's it? Hold Steve. on. Steve. Let's do that again. Okay. Shout out to Steve and Indy. That's my boy, man. We'll be hanging out. Cool. Oh, Ross. Steve Ross. Good stuff. All right. And uh, my recommendation, I just saw, uh, this had been in theaters a while back, but it's sort of uh, having a little bit of a a resurgence with special screenings, Uh, Little Pink House, which stars- Is that a John Cougar Mellencamp song? It is not a John Cougar Mellencamp. It's uh, it's a movie. Little Pink Houses. On the Prairie. For you and me. Ooh, on the Prairie. Little Pink House on the Prairie. (laughs) Uh, Sorry, Nick. I've destroyed your recommendation. (laughs) This is uh, it's a movie starring Catherine Keener and Gene Triplehorn. Um, it is about <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly what you're thinking. What What are you thinking? What's Jackie Jackie, or Jackie Jackie Treehorn? Treehorn. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, Gene Triplehorn, not Jackie Treehorn. And it is about the um, the Supreme Court. It's about the Kilo decision. So Suzette Kilo was uh, in New London, Connecticut. Is that not where Nick Melillo's from? Is he from New London, or am I making that up? I don't know if he's from New London. All right. Well, maybe old London. Maybe old London. No, I have been to New. That's a beautiful old town. All right. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> New London, Connecticut. Uh, I don't know whether that's actually where where Nick is from, but in any case, uh, this Sorry, is. Um, it was a, uh, a Supreme Court case about eminent domain. So the whole thing was that the governor of Connecticut wants to improve his poll numbers. So he tries to use eminent domain through this uh, kind of more or less like a shell corp- development corporation to seize a whole bunch of homes in this one neighborhood to sell the land to Pfizer. And this was right around the time that they had developed Viagra. So they're ready to expand and whatever. And then Suzette Kilo takes the case all the way to the Supreme Court to save her home from being seized via eminent domain i won't spoil the ending here uh but uh it is worth seeing especially if you you know if you feel like you know energized and and interested in this whole cra thing it's sort of um you know uh, a story about the the federal government getting involved in in the private sector and kind of overreaching in in ways that are somewhat similar so definitely worth checking out uh and also related recommendation I saw this movie uh, having bought the tickets on Tug.com, which sounds like a dirty website, but is not. It's T-U-G-G dot com. Pretty cool. So the screening was organized by the Institute for Justice, which is the law firm that represented Suzette Kilo. And this website, I have discovered, uh, has a library of something like 16,000 movies. And you it allows you to, provided that there are participating theaters in your area organize movie screenings uh you sell the tickets through this website they'll screen it at the theater so long as you reach whatever the critical mass is of people you know required to rsvp and then you keep five percent of the ticket sales so a pretty cool thing you know if you have a a movie you want to see or you know maybe even uh i don't know whatever something you want to put together it's a cool easy way to put together events uh we've been kind of 
shooting around the idea of uh, of experimenting with this for ourselves since there are a lot of movie theaters near cigar shops. It'd be cool to like, you know, get a bunch of people together, watch a movie uh, on a big screen, and then go smoke and talk about it. I say we do it. Yeah. So anyway, tug.com and Little Pink House. Uh, that's all I got. Anybody else got something to add? No, man. Cool. It's all good. Nope. All right. Keep them lit, y'all. Take care.